once around SIMP 0136. These names get more obscure, don't they? But this one is a very interesting object, albeit rather faint. So let's have a look at it. Discovered in 2009 by the Spitzer Space Telescope, an infrared telescope, and followed up by Hubble, and then more recently by the James Webb Telescope as well. It's in the constellation of Pisces the fish, but you're not going to be able to track it down with amateur equipment. It's far too faint. Somebody will probably prove me wrong for saying that, but uh, I don't mind. It's moving, it's changing its position by over one arc second every year. As we observe the precise location of it from year to year, we can see that this means it must be close to the sun. And in fact, parallax methods of measurement using the Earth's orbit as a baseline give us a figure of around 20 light years. Now the brightness of it, magnitude 21, that really is a bit of a challenge. Pluto is about 13 and each step on the magnitude scale is a factor of 2.5. Five steps is in fact a factor of 100. That's where the definition of a magnitude uh, comes from. It's the uh, 2.5 is the fifth root of 100, in fact, um, 2.512 to be precise. So this is getting on for 10 magnitudes uh, fainter than Pluto and therefore a factor of several thousand times fainter overall. So very difficult to observe indeed. But with these amazing space telescopes, we've been able to pick this up and watch it move across the sky from year to year. So what is it? Well, we think it's a rogue planet, a planet without a star to orbit. And these can originate in one of a number of ways. It's possible that they could have formed separately, could have formed in a cloud of gas and dust and just collapsed under their own gravity, or with a group of other objects uh, as part of a larger cluster, perhaps, or indeed as part of a stellar system. And this might have been the, one of the planets around another star that's been kicked out of that star system by a close encounter. Perhaps two of the planets came close to each other and the gravitational slingshot hurled this one out across space. So now it's just minding its own business and orbiting the Milky Way galaxy, much as our sun does on its 250 million year journey around the Milky Way. We seem to find, be finding quite a lot of these rogue planets, these free floating planets, if you want to call them that instead. And uh, that's obviously a sign that our instruments are getting better. But SIMP 0136 is particularly interesting. It's part of a moving group, the Carina Near Stellar Moving Group. This is about 20 fairly faint stars that have been discovered, all sharing the same trajectory in three dimensions and tracing back to an origin somewhere in the constellation of Carina, as if around 200 million years ago, they were all formed together and perhaps SIMP 0136 was formed within that group maybe independently as a separate member of the group, or maybe part of one of the star systems that then got kicked out. But it seems to be moving on more or less the same trajectory as the other members of this uh, collection of fairly faint stars. Now I said it's a rogue planet. It's actually on the boundary between what we would call a gas giant planet and a brown dwarf. The mass is estimated to be 13 times that of Jupiter, and that is right on the cusp. We give the designation of gas giant to things like Saturn and Jupiter and to larger planets all the way up to this magic figure of 13 Jupiter masses. And then from 13 to 75 or perhaps 80, we call them brown dwarfs. And above that limit, then we call them stars. And the difference is that stars carry out ordinary nuclear fusion using hydrogen, protons. They do the proton-proton chain, creating helium and releasing energy. 
gas giants don't do any nuclear reactions at all. And the brown dwarfs are in between. They can't generate the temperatures and pressures necessary to fuse ordinary hydrogen, but they can form the uh, heavy hydrogen, deuterium, and fuse it into the heavier elements. So the initial load that they start with of deuterium can be fused. And they can also do a little bit of lithium fusion and release energy that way. And therefore they can be a little bit warmer, but there's precious little of either of those two isotopes around. And so they don't have very much by way of fuel. But this magic figure, 13, is just about the cutoff point. So below 13, you won't get enough pressure to be able to start fusing um, the deuterium or even the lithium reactions. And so SIMPO 136 is one of those missing link characters that's right on the boundary between the two. So what is it, a gas giant or a brown dwarf? Well, the temperature of 1,243 Kelvin is too high for a gas giant. It tells us that really we're dealing with a brown dwarf here. Um, and it puts it in that T category, the middle ranking temperature range for brown dwarfs. So we have L, T, and Y. These stars go O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. And then below M, in terms of brightness, below the red dwarf stars, class M, we have the L dwarfs. And then we have T and then the coolest Y. And they're classified according to their uh, temperatures. You can see that a T dwarf is in the range 500 to 1500 Kelvin. And this one at 1243 is towards the hotter end of the T range. So classed as T 2.5. The numbers after the letter go T0 for the very hottest T type down to T9, which would be the coolest. So this is quite hot for such a low mass object. And that is because it is young. It is only 200 million years of age. And therefore, it still carries most of the residual heat of formation augmented perhaps by a little bit of those nuclear reactions that we were talking about but really it's at the low mass end of things so it's going to struggle to do anything other than the very simplest ones. Now at that sort of temperature it will glow in the infrared part of the spectrum and be far easier to detect that's why the space telescope Spitzer which was an infrared telescope was the first one to detect it. Hubble could also do observations in the infrared, but it's perfect for James Webb to have a look at. James Webb is really a successor to Spitzer more than it is a successor to Hubble. It can do optical uh, observations, but its real uh, power comes into play in the infrared. It can go much deeper into the infrared part of the spectrum than Hubble ever could. There's two instruments, the near spec spectrometer and the MIRI instrument. Near spec does near infrared, so 0 0.6 to 5.3 microns, and MIRI longer wavelengths, 5 microns down to 14 microns for the mid infrared, and that's beyond the reach of Hubble. So perfect for studying these relatively cool objects where all the energy output is in that infrared band. So what we were able to observe with James Webb was that if you looked at SIMP 0136 for a period of a number of hours, you could see that it was rotating and that it takes just 2.4 hours to spin around on its axis. Jupiter takes about 10, Saturn's a bit longer, and uh, it seems that these larger brown dwarfs pick up more on angular momentum and uh, end up with a higher spin rate once they've collapsed down to size. It makes sense, rather like a, a skater pulling their arms in when they go into a spin, they spin up faster. Stars tend to be slower, but that's because they tend to push out a lot of uh, high energy particles in their solar wind, and that carries away the angular momentum, so it tends to slow them down. So these uh, 
brown dwarfs tend to spin quite fast. It also revealed that we're looking at uh, SIMP 0136, more or less equator on, which is a perfect way to look at these things. It can be rather difficult if you're looking at them pole on. Now you've got the light curve traces for the different uh, color bands, the different infrared bands. And these were able to start to tell us not only that the object varied in brightness from place to place as it rotated, but it uh, was telling us about the chemical composition as well. In fact, we have a weather forecast for SIMP 0136, partly cloudy with sandstorms and iron rain lower down. I think that's fantastic. James Webb monitored the spectrum over several rotations using the near spec and revealed around about 60 to 70 percent cloud cover where those clouds were not made of water vapor like they are on the earth but they were made of phosphorite which is magnesium silicate so uh, essentially uh, a sand like rock and he, this time it's not uh, just ordinary silicon dioxide it's magnesium silicate phosphorite clouds that were revealed covering about 70 percent of the surface but there were gaps through and we were able to see lower down to signs of clouds of iron so iron rain probably falling from these clouds onto the planet deeper inside the planet the temperature being much hotter indeed i call it a planet I think planet is a good description for this object. It's right on the cusp of the brown dwarf planet line. So I'm going with rogue planet. And we were able to find things out about the higher atmosphere as well. The spectrum revealed methane, water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and other chemicals. And it revealed an upwelling of these gases and hot spots which we think are caused by aurora and the aurora falling of electrons into the upper atmosphere triggering chemical reactions and energizing the gases and this is producing a very complex carbon chemistry as the carbon monoxide and dioxide get energized by the electrons and are triggered to react with the methane and with the ammonia and create all sorts of interesting chemical soup in this very, very peculiar atmosphere. So absolutely fascinating um, that this planet can be doing that. And not only do we think that the aurora might be present, we've detected them using the VLA, the array of radio telescopes made famous by that uh, film Contact with Jodie Foster, where she was sitting listening for aliens on the headsets in front of the array of radio dishes. And these were able to detect the pulses of radio waves coming from the aurora on SIMP 0136. And JWST was able to confirm those uh, visible light pulses going with that as well. Now this is fantastic. It might enable us to understand the dynamo effect that creates the magnetic fields that result in these aurora here on Earth. And we think that that requires you to be rotating fast, which we are in 24 hours, in which SIMP 0136 is certainly doing in 2.4 hours, 10 times faster for such a large body. That's a really rapid rotation and creating a very strong magnetic field. But usually it requires a liquid metal core. So maybe there is some sort of metal core. Maybe that goes with the iron rain that we were talking about. But it often is blamed on being in orbit around the sun in the case of the planets. So you have to be rotating, have a conducting core and be inside the sun's magnetic field and be rotating around uh, in order for the dynamo effect to be explained. And clearly SIMP 0136 is not in orbit around a parent star, so something slightly different going on there that's going to take some explaining. And just to finish off with, the suggestion to explain that is that maybe it's not actually alone. Maybe it has companions. Maybe it has some large moon or moons orbiting around it 
or another unseen companion, not a star, but a planet-sized object or a moon-sized object, and it is the orbital motion relative to that that is giving us the dynamo effect. So we need to study this further in order to determine whether this free-floating planet, nearly a uh, brown dwarf size object, is in fact accompanied by its own moons. There's definitely been some modelling suggesting that that might be the case. So thanks very much for listening and that was once around SIMP 0136 and I'll leave it there.